Hello and welcome to episode number 52 of the Sweeper Keeper podcast. Today's episode is presented by our friends at EA Sports, who have brought the most prestigious club competition to FIFA 19 by introducing the UEFA Champions League. Official match presentation, a variety of tournament options, and an all-new commentary team, all available right now in FIFA 19. I'm your host, Gianluca Neshi, and a quick note before we get underway... Listeners, if you're checking this out on the standard audio-only version, wherever you listen to your podcasts, that's fine. But this is a video podcast today. So if you want to check out our faces on your screens, I'm not sure why you would want to do that. But if you're a glutton for punishment, that option is available to you. And the two lovely faces that you'll see sitting across from me are that of Daniel Rouse. All right. And sitting next to him, Mr. Michael Chandler is here as well. Hello. And guys, let's get into a little bit of the Champions League today. That's the big story, of course. Match day five kicked off. Let's start with Manchester City. Rouse, this is a game that you watched very closely. An exciting game. Very entertaining. End-to-end, City Leon, 2-2. Maxwell Cornet really stole the show. Wasn't quite enough, though, because of a late Sergio Aguero equalizer. And as a result, City are going through the knockout stages. No, it's the fourth time this season we've seen teams have a bit of a go at City and it seems to work. Liverpool and Wolves got draws against them in the league and now Leon twice have given a real go over. Obviously, they beat them earlier in the group stage and got a draw against them here and probably should have won the game. You know, Cornet really gave City the one run around a four or while. And is that, do I pronounce that right? Yeah, I feel like it's, it's close enough. Yeah, there's just lo- lo- loads of vowels in there. It's pretty difficult <laughs> for me. It's Hussam Ouar. Ouar. He yeah. was quite quality. And then probably the man <laughs> of the match for me was Ndombele, who was uh, absolutely fantastic. He almost got the um, the turn of like Bernardo Silva and how he can shake off his man. Very, very positive from deep in the midfield. He was absolutely excellent. I just thought tactically... Genesio again set up so well against City. The front three as well, you know, Fernandinho had a horrible time out there. He could have been sent off actually. And, you know, the way they set up with uh, Fakir and the two others either side of the front three just basically blocking off all the options from playing from the back. And, you know, it makes you wonder if, you know, you don't watch Leagun that much. You wonder, you know, one, why is Genesio not so popular with Lyon fans? And then two, why aren't they putting up a bigger fight with PSG at the top of the Leagun table? That's a great question. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to echo what you said, full credit to Genesio, because there are questions in France about his pedigree as a manager and if he can sort of guide Les Gants over that sort of proverbial hump. But that's twice he's got it right against City. We remember in the first leg at the Etihad, that shocking win for Lyon. They set up just one up top and they played Memphis Depay as that sort of false nine, and he was quite effective. And like you said, today it was Cornet and Depay up front with Nabil Fakir in support with Usam Ouad and Tangi Dumbele, two players you've noted earlier, uh, behind him. And and it was quite good. And I think there, I think maybe that's a little bit of a blueprint for other clubs who like to sit back and sort of just defend against City to maybe just have a go at them. Not to uh, discredit the defending though as well. They started with a back three, but they also had the wings back there. And they're just so organized in how they so quickly flatten to a back five when they're out of possession. And the three in the, in the middle were so, so tight. And you had David Silva and Aguero just trying to twist and turn in the smallest of situations. And it really, really frustrated them. And in the end, City got their two goals by set pieces. Chandler, for people who don't watch a ton of this Leon side or a ton of Liga in general... Um, we know how great they are bringing up young kids and especially the crop they have right now of the current squad who do you think is the most likely to earn a big move to the Premier League La Liga Serie A etc etc well for me the guy the the prominent person in the shop window is Tangi Dumbele in terms of a physical big midfielder who's also very graceful on the ball and good in possession I think he's sort of that two-way versatile player uh, and in saying that, also his partner in the midfield today, Hussam Ouar, we know he's been linked uh, with Liverpool, who were also in uh, the in on uh, Nabil Fekir last summer. And also Ferland Mendy, who got you know his first call-up to the France senior side during the Nations League window there. He's a very, very promising young player who actually looks as good going forward as he does defending. So we talk about, you know, Lyon uh, and they're, you know, they're very like uh, famous and sort of like decorated academy, sort of just producing these players. It's definitely for me, uh, Dumbele, Ouad, and then to a lesser degree, the left back Mendy. 
It's very, very easy to make parallels with the Monaco team of a couple of seasons ago with the young players and the, the really, really great attacking play. And one bit that really pleased me was, you know, I mentioned Fernandinho having a nightmare, could have been sent off. He, uh, he gave up a foul in the middle of the park. You know, other teams would have probably gone around the referee and said, give him this second yellow, get this, get this fellow off, this, uh, off the pitch right now. But they didn't. They got the ball, they passed it quickly, and then by the end of it, Cornet puts him back in the lead with an absolutely fantastic goal. Chandler, very quickly, Furlan Mendy, the superior left back of the uh, Mendy clan. Well, I don't know if it'll cost you 52 million <laughs> quid, but just taking the mickey here because Benjamin Mendy, a player I really, really like, can't seem to keep fit. Uh, but like I said, look, credit to Genesio. And it's a bit strange because Maxwell Cornet, uh, who has now scored three goals in two matches against City, looks to be sort of the, you know, the kryptonite to Guardiola's very, very strong team. He hasn't started yet in the league. He's made eight appearances off the bench, as Genesio prefers domestically. Some combination of Bertrand Traore. Uh, we've also forgotten about Moussa Dembele, who made the move from Celtic in the summer, uh, as well as Martin Terrier, a player who's very, very good last year on loan at Strasbourg from Lille. Couple all those players together with a Depay, who's looked very good in a very forward, advanced role this year. And there are a lot of options for Genesio at Lyon. I think, you know, just to flip it on the other side, I think City fans would probably point to a couple of weaknesses in the squad. I've been complimentary of Zinchenko before, and I do think he's going to be important for City this season because of Mendy's uh, injury issues at left-back. But I thought he looked particularly lightweight today. And also, Raheem Sterling was almost playing as a central midfielder, as like a number eight, and this is very unfamiliar. Like, I kind of imagine Pep turning him into a central, you know, striker eventually. But he was, yeah, as a number eight with uh, Riyad Mahrez on the right-hand side. And... It worked in spells, but I think overall this is not something we're going to see on a regular basis. You got Pep turning Fabian Delph into a left back, turning Raheem Sterling into a central player. It's just Pep things, man. You know he likes to play around with positions. It's very fluid for Pep Guardiola. So that's the story in Group F from that match, City against Lyon. The other one, probably the most exciting match of the day, actually, Shakhtar and Hoffenheim. You know, Chandler, we talked about all those exciting Lyon players. And now they've played City tough twice, beat them once, drew them today. But they're not quite through just yet. And that's because Shakhtar got a late, late, late goal to get a 3-2 win against Hoffenheim. And goals, more goals for Shakhtar from Brazilian players, which has been a theme of theirs for uh, multiple seasons now in the Champions League. Yeah, Tezon completed his brace in the 92nd minute to vault Shakhtar to a 3-2 victory, which means Lyon will travel to the Ukraine and they will need at least a point to guarantee progression to the knockout stage. And that is now 82 goals from Brazilians in the Champions League for Shakhtar Donetsk, which is second only to Barcelona, who have 83. So a cool little stat to keep an eye on as we approach match day six. Very important. Do you call it the Ukraine or Ukraine? I call it the Ukraine. <laughs> <Or else>? Which... <laughs> It's just Ukraine, isn't it? I, I still feel like he thinks there's a city called Madras in India, though. He's from a different era, isn't what he? Is, so, is it the Philippines? I think that one is the Philippines. I do call it the Philippines. God forbid I make an error on this podcast. <laughs> well, we make sure to point all of them out every time you do. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so let's rein it back in. Like I said, that's the story in Group F. City are through Leon and Shakhtar battling for that last spot on match day six. Let's flip over to Group H, the other Manchester club. We'll start there because Juve and Manchester United are through in that group. Juventus 1-0 over Valencia. Not particularly exciting. Mandzukic with the goal. Okay, fine. But other than that, a pretty dull one in Turin. Manchester United, even when it's dull and the football is very often dull, there is some kind of excitement. And today it was Meruen Fellaini. Of course it was Meruen Fellaini. At the death with a 91st minute winner against Young Boys. Uh, Chandler, maybe more of note, Jose Mourinho's reaction to that goal. It all starts with Mourinho and it ends with Mourinho. And in saying it ends with Mourinho, he went absolutely postal on, I don't know what you call that, but a thing holding bottles of water bottles and Lucasaid. Like, I guess your dentist isn't the only one who dislikes Lucasaid, which is a lovely fizzy drink. <laughs> uh, for some reason, branded as a sports drink. Um, but yeah, Mourinho went absolutely nuts there celebrating the Fellaini win. And I'm kind of happy for Fellaini. He sort of reminds me of what um, Tottenham's Musa Sissoko is turning into. This sort of laughing stock who's now a cult hero. 
And Fellaini's 90th minute goal was uh, United's first 90th minute goal in the Champions League since Cristiano Ronaldo did it in 07 against his boyhood club Sporting. But in saying it started with Mourinho, I'm saying that because when the team sheets came out, Alexis Sanchez's name was not on the 18-man squad. Lukaku and Pogba were benched. Uh, the Portuguese gaffer opted for a front three of Marcus Rashford in the middle with Jesse Lingard and Anthony Marshall flanking him. And I feel I'm a little gutted for Rashford. He just can't find a rhythm all year. He couldn't hit the target to save his life. Uh, to be fair, they're quite fluid. They're quite organic. He offered a little bit more in terms of that than would Lukaku. But they were so disjointed. There's so much of a disconnect from that midfield of Nemanja Matic, Marouane Fellaini, and Fred, and that front three. And you have to wonder, why is Mourinho dropping players who he insists are out of form, but he continues to start Nemanja Matic, who has just been out of form all season. They brought Antonio Valencia off in the second half, moved Phil Jones, who is to pace what, I mean, an ottoman is to movement, moved him out, <laughs> moved him out to right back and put Matic in the middle of the central defense, right next to Chris Smalling, who, before I finish my soliloquy, I must add, I'm hearing reports of a contract extension for Christopher Smalling, which must be one of the most idiotic things I've heard in the English top flight of recent. He is not good, and he is not good enough to start for a team who should harbor title ambitions. And when he puts pen to paper on that, I think every other team in Europe will rejoice and celebrate because, yeah, he is a bit of a donkey back there. And, you know, the, the way you talk about Rashford, it's almost as if uh, Mourinho can't improve players, isn't it? You know, we discussed this before. And as for uh, as for Fellaini, you know, as Fellaini. you said... Uh, hey, Fellaini! <laughs> it's a bit of a laughing stock, but... He's actually Man United's second best midfielder, and that's a, a you know a basically a credit to him and a damning indictment of this Mourinho regime, where it's just like a a long painful death, isn't it? I mean, he's probably going to survive the season, but he's going to be gone next summer, and they're going to finish fifth and sixth in the league, and it's just going to be a wasted season. Yeah, but Fellaini's done it again. He did not need that beautifully fibered quaff he'd been wearing for so many years. He's got a haircut. He's still performing at a top level. And there are hordes of fans sitting in the first row at the Theater of Dreams who are now covered in Lucasade, whether it be Pineapple Punch, <laughs> Black Current Bliss, or my new favorite, Croft Apple. They're covered in the fizzy drink. Lucasade, if you're watching or listening, I'm looking for a sponsor. Those all sound <laughs> delicious. Marouane Fellaini, like a reverse Samson, cuts his hair and still continues to score goals. Not that I am the authority on uh, all things follicle but uh, the ricardo quaresma doppelganger over nevertheless here. Oh, you no, look great uh, you honestly look great. i was trimming my beard the other day and i thought i should collect some of this take you know thatch up a nice little ginger tea <laughs> pay for uh, for john luca here it'd be lovely uh, that's too much yeah. i wouldn't say that <laughs> yeah, that'd but be like surely a, that... a wayne rooney-esque hair job but yeah that incandescent lighting above us isn't helping anyone's <laughs> so that's the group h story like i said juve and manchester united are both through they're going into the final match, top spot in that group, still not quite decided. United, in theory, could leapfrog Juve, Juve excuse me, for first place. Juventus on 12 points, Manchester United on 10. You would think Juve will be able to lock it down. They play young boys in match day six. So that's group H, and let's flip over now to group G. Real Madrid, Roma, Victoria Pilsen, CSK, Moscow. This was actually decided in the early matches of today with a big surprise. Victoria Pilsen beating CSK Moscow, going away to Moscow and winning. That result saw Real Madrid and Roma lock up their places in the knockout stage. And then they met in the Eternal City later on in the day to jockey for position, first top spot and second in the group. Roma played pretty well in the first half. And then some defensive issues come to light in the second, and we see Gareth Bale open the scoring. Lucas Vasquez finishes it off. 2-0 for Real Madrid. The big story, though, I think, from this one, Chengiz under with what has to be the miss of the season. <laughs> and I'm setting you guys up for some terrible under-over puns. So I apologize in advance, but let's hear him. Yo, I'm over those underwhelming puns because oh. my Twitter timeline was littered with them. Just the peak creativity from the people I follow. But yeah, if you missed it, uh, the Turk, he had a wide open sitter. And instead of deciding to just pass it into the back of the net he skied it so under went over and it was pretty much on the stroke of halftime and then what happened talk about the tables turning 
out of the break. Gareth Bale scores after Robin Olsen's sort of inexplicably poor clearance is headed back to the keeper by Federico Fazio and the Welshman Bale gets on the end of it. Straightforward, straightforward goal. And it's funny, we talk about how, you know, Karim Benzema, his goal scoring numbers have declined a little bit. If you watch that goal again, Benzema is putting the pressure on Fazio that forces the center back to make that error. And then if we watch Lucas Vasquez's second goal that made it 2-0, essentially put the tie out of reach. It's Benzema who's unselfish again, plays a pinpoint header into the path of the Spanish attacker. 2-0, game done, free Benzo. Yeah, I think uh, Fazio definitely doesn't deserve the majority of stick for that goal. That Robin Olsen kick, it was like a you know a rugby scrum half, you know, just lofting it to his winger. It was just like no distance to it, just all height, and it was just terrible. It was Robin to be Olsen's gobbled. not good. Sorry, to he's rubbish. No, he's just spoiler not alert. Good. <laughs> eh? No, they thought they're like last year we had Allison. Let's go get another keeper with a woman's name, and maybe he'll be as good. Well, guess what? Robin is not a third of the keeper that Allison is. He's absolutely rubbish. Hang on, Robin's a no. Robin Robin Hood's pretty badass. Robin. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Agree to disagree. <laughs> Daniel, Michael, and John Luke over here with really diverse first names. But anyways, <laughs> no, and I feel bad. I feel bad for Roma. I feel bad for Eusebio Di Francesco, a manager I really like. Uh, once again, Robin Olsen has, has let them down. And that's after last year. They they progressed really deep into Europe. They made the semifinals of the Champions League. We were all shocked by it. And in doing so, they got really, really good performances out of the likes of Costas Manolas, Fazio, who we've mentioned. And we know that being a center half, so much of your sort of form is tethered to that of your keeper. And if you have a garbage shot stopper behind you, you're going to play like garbage. It's sort of the inverse of playing in front of David De Gea. And speaking of the centre backs, you know, on the other side of this, we've been very critical of Real Madrid on this podcast. And, you know, I've said before, I quite enjoy them not having a very good time. But I thought Varane and Ramos much, much improved today. And uh, one particular far post clearance from Varane, which was very, very good. So that is Group G. Real Madrid locked into first place. Roma in second. Chana, like you said, you know, they made that deep run last year at the semifinals. Nobody really expects that of them this season. Um, you never know how the draw plays out. Maybe they get a lucky one. Um, they're going to be in second, so in theory, it should be a more difficult draw. But we'll see. They're already on their way through. And then it's Victoria Pilsen and CSKA Moscow battling for that Europa League spot. That's Group G. One more from Tuesday's action, and that's Group E, which is also decided. Bayern Munich and Ajax on their way to the knockout stages. Ajax, or else the first time in 13 years. Um, there were... A couple of big takeaways, not only on the pitch from this one, but off as well. We saw some uh, unsavory scenes in the stands at AAK Athens. No, after all that Copa Libertadores chaos, I'm quite sick of uh, you know fan trouble and to see that you know big explosions going off in the Ajax end. It's really, really dangerous as well. Like AAK Athens guys basically running onto the pitch to throw these missiles and the security just standing there and watching them. And uh, Athens have already got a partial stadium closure hanging over them, so they'll definitely get that now next home game in Europe. And I think it should be a lot more than that. It should be a full empty stadium for that. I have to say my favourite takeaway from this game is Dusan Tadic. A couple of goals in this game. It's good to see him winning it for him. You know, three days after Southampton start, Manolo Gabbiadini on the wing. <laughs> There's Dusan Tadic getting his team into the knockout stages. And he's been great for them. A really, really good captain straight in there. Yeah, a Dusan Tadic that costs the Amsterdam club 10 million quid. From Southampton, who, by the way, look destined to go down. They're absolutely horrendous under Mark Hughes. They're in the bottom three. They let Tadic walk for 10 million quid. They sent Sofiane Buffal on loan, which essentially just took all of any wide attacks they had in that Saints club. And we see they're, they're being rightly punished for it this year. But credit to Tadic. Credit to Dali Blind and to your boy Frankie de Jong, who is in the sort of on the left side of a three-man midfield. And that left side was very, very profitable for Ajax, they kind of stayed away from the right side. David Neres, the Brazilian, who's sort of jonesing for that call up to uh, Brazil senior squad. Very, very good last year. He's taken a little bit of a step back. So, you know, quite intelligently, Ajax put all the emphasis on the left side. I thought they're brilliant. And, you know, for all the talk of Frankie de Jong and Matias Delight being very good, shout outs to Lasse Schoen, who was in the middle of that three man midfield. I thought it was a really composed, mature performance from him. And for a young side that are kind of desperate 
for a leader, I thought Shona was very good. Yeah, good call out for him. And yeah, I'm a big fan of Frankie de Jong. He was you know, just very, very patient. A lot of young players would have got a bit erratic, got a bit frustrated, didn't go ahead. But he's really stepping back, just looking at his options, very, very composed. You know, he is a ready-made Manchester City or Barcelona player. It's going to happen. And also, I wanted to say Donny van der Beek. You know, somebody people don't often talk about, but he's a young lad as well. He's only 21, and I really, really appreciate his work off the ball. He's always asking for it, and his runs, you know, really, really fantastic decoy runs from him. So there's a lot of good young talent coming through Ajax. I just hope they manage to keep hold of it. Yeah, Donny Vanderbeek. I love that fella on Dawson's Creek. If you remember <laughs> him playing the protagonist. But no, all through that Ajax lineup, there's really, really good players. And I think as we look at sort of this move towards these Edersons, these Allisons, these keepers that are very very good at playing it from the back shout outs to Cameroonian shot stopper Andre Onana who is still only 22 the Ajax number one looks very very good and for all the talk of De Jong and Delight getting you know big marquee moves to some of Europe's biggest clubs I would keep an eye out for Andre Onana I think he's a really really good young player oh na 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 <laughs> oh boy <laughs> we're gonna stop that before it starts. Yeah, Lauren Hill if you're watching the podcast so no, apologies <laughs> On the flip side of all that young IX talent, you know, that production line just continues to churn out exciting players. Bayern Munich continues to do it with the old guard. <sighs> Frank Rivery and Aryan Robin in particular, 5-1 win over Benfica to lock up their place in the knockout stage. I mean, it's like we're in 2005 all over again. Robin and Ribery continuing to do the business for Bayern. Yeah, maybe not. They're not quite as decrepit as we thought they were. They're probably only about two, maybe two years away from getting signed from West Ham today. Oh. Now, yeah, West Ham, you know, they normally scout players around the 2011, 2012 mark. I think two more years. Just let them disintegrate a little bit more, get them in that West Ham side. If Arjen Robin ends up at West Ham, come on. <laughs> Ribery, maybe. Trash in the hammer. Is that going to give Sammy Nasri your home address, buddy? <laughs> He's coming for your lot. Jeez. But, you know, Benfica were horrid. I mean, look, uh, credit to Lewandowski. He now has 51 goals in Europe, becoming the seventh player to reach the milestone of 50 goals in the Champions League and the third quickest after Ruud van Nistelrooy and someone named Leo Messi. So quite the accomplish accomplishment for him and for Bayern, a straightforward result that will have manager Niko Kovac breathing a sigh of relief because domestically they're sitting fifth. They are nine points adrift of rival Borussia Dortmund for the top spot in Germany, and there's been a lot of talk of Niko Kovac's first season at the Allianz Arena, ending prematurely with reports of Arsene Wenger potentially <laughs> taking the job, which I would love. Uh, I love Germany. and uh... <laughs> uh, What did you think about Jerome Boateng losing possession? Uh, from where I'm standing, I did not see the incident, <laughs> but I trust my players. We work on that on the training ground. So that is Group E. We'll close it out with Chandler's lovely impression of Arsene Wenger. Bayern and Ajax are going through. And that's the story for Tuesday's Champions League action, gents. Tomorrow we do it all over again with uh, a little bit of a more exciting slate, I think I would say, including the big one, Liverpool against PSG, which Chandler, I know you are very much looking forward to. I am absolutely chuffed to watch that match. We found out today that both Mbappe and Neymar will start. And, you know, it was kind of funny. Jurgen Klopp was talking uh, in the Liverpool press conference about we're actually happier to know who we are playing against. It's easier for us to prepare. We're not sure if Sadio Mane will be fit to play. So an opportunity for someone to step into that front three alongside Mo Salah and Roberto Firmino, potentially. But I'm expecting a really, really kind of gangbusters performance from a PSG side who have lost once this year. It was the fixture at Anfield where they were horrid. They have since gone on a run of 12 matches unbeaten, pairing 10 victories with two draws, and they've outscored opponents 38-7 to over that spell. Cavani's found form. Neymar Mbappe are fit. Watch out, Liverpool. I'm personally most excited for Tottenham into Milan because obviously Tottenham is a must-win game. We've just seen them play fantastically against Chelsea in the league and, you know, see this reborn Musa Sissoko do this kind of N'Golo Kante light role. <laughs> uh, you know, see Son, Eriksen and Kane up front. I'd like to see Harry Rinks put in a lineup just to kind of retain possession a little bit more. But I think that is just to really test this Tottenham side's metal a little bit, see them go out there. Yeah, and you know what, Luciano Spalletti, the inter manager, if you're watching or listening to this podcast, I'm sure he is. Everything <laughs> and the kitchen sink at the Spurs. 
because on the weekend they have a little match, a little visit to the Emirates Stadium up to Holloway Road to face Arsenal, who I support. This is on video. Can you see my Marouane Shamak jersey right now? <laughs> this is like one of a kind. Shamak's mom doesn't own this, okay? So <laughs> Shamak himself probably doesn't even own his own He's Arsenal probably sold kit. it to Sammy Nasri. Oh, my goodness. So that is the story tomorrow. A couple of big ones to watch out for. And we'll be back here to break all of it down. You get to look at our lovely faces again one more time. Apologies for that. Really, sorry. <laughs> That'll do it for today, guys. So thank you very much to Danny Rouse. Thank you. And to Michael Chandler. Thank you. And to producer Gino. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> thank you, Gino, for buying us dinner tonight. Thank you. He's obligated to do that now. To I, think so. Yeah, yeah, I think I, so. That yeah. sounds right. To be determined at a later date. <laughs> I'm John Luganeshi. Thank you guys most importantly for listening or watching. I'll talk to you later.